So again, we're going to be talking about how humans learn by uh, Joshua R. Eiler. And I am Lindsay Vreeland. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an inclusive teaching coordinator for CIDL at NIU. So in this workshop, I'm hoping that we'll all gain an understanding of the five key concepts in course design that Eiler sets out. We'll be able to uh, analyze and discuss the impact of the five concepts on student learning um, and think about how they apply to course structures to enhance student engagement and success. And we'll engage in collaborative discussions with uh, with each other, sharing our experiences, asking questions, and applying key concepts. Let me turn off my little person. Um, and again, uh, feel free to type in the chat as things occur to you, uh, share as much as you want to share. And if you have questions that occur to you later, please email me. Please have those conversations with me. I am here for that reason. Some of us take a little bit more time to reflect and then um, come up with ideas and that is normal, um, that is okay, that means that you uh, are actively thinking about things, which is amazing. Um, so this is what the book looks like. Uh, you do have availability to the book in through the library. I'm not sure if it is, uh, if there is a physical copy, um, you can also ask me about it and I can lend you it through the CITL library as well. So um, in Eiler's book, he lays out this idea that children and adult learners aren't that different, uh, which is different than some other people have been saying for a while. Um, but he talks specifically about the plasticity of brains and talks about how we're constantly learning. So while uh, we tend to think about children learning huge things and it rewiring their brains, he's saying that um, new information is constantly coming in. We're constantly learning. Um, but that just means that in order for it to be retrievable and useful, and stick with us for a long time. It has to be used in a in a significant way. So um, a lot of the information might be novel to children, and it might not be to us. But that means that we need to uh, really do what we can to ingrain that information. Um, we learn how we we learn how to learn as children, and we use those same processes throughout. Uh, adulthood. And there are five features within a course that have an, a significant impact on student learning and can also serve us in the world beyond um, formal education. And those, uh, those five features are curiosity, authenticity, sociality, emotion, and failure. And for those of us that have had jobs that we've learned things um, during, in addition to uh, formal education systems, I think that this uh, that these concepts will really uh, strike true to uh, to us. Um, although maybe maybe it doesn't seem as applicable to the classroom. So the first concept is curiosity. Um, and Eiler says that when we're simply told how to do something, we're less interested. Uh, but if we can explore a topic together, uh, ask and answer questions, discover tips, tricks, features, apply elsewhere, the information is more likely to be understood and retained, excuse me. Um, and I'm sure some of you are already doing these things in your class, right? You're, uh, having hands-on activities, you're thinking about things in a new way, in an interesting way, applying information to real-world experiences, and we know that students are more likely to be interested 
uh, but also learn that way. Um, so something that Eiler asks us to think about are what are the driving questions of our course? So not only think about like, this is the learning objective, but what's the driving question behind that? And what curiosities do you and your students have on the topic? Uh, how can you work towards answering them and building on them? So that might be uh, submitting a survey in the beginning of class that might be thinking about um, reflecting on yourself and what curiosities you had regarding that um, topic when you first started looking into the field. He also says that authenticity is very important. So this idea that learning is centered on authentic, relevant, real world tasks. Um, and again, this links to curiosity in some um, interesting ways as well, uh, that students are actively engaged in exploration and inquiry, that learning is often interdisciplinary. So we're not just looking at, um, geometry for geometry's sake, we're thinking about it in context of the real world of how students might actually use it in their day-to-day uh, -day lives or um, even in niche uh, sort of activities that they might not be doing day-to-day, -day, but it might be applicable in the future. Um, and some of this authenticity also might come from role-playing, modeling a workplace, in-class demonstrations, collaborating with appropriate workplaces or offices or groups on campus. So where does this information apply outside of this workspace and outside of this textbook? So to get into a little bit more about authenticity, uh, you can break that down into four different types of authentic learning, which overlap, um, thinking about authentic context, so solving a real problem that's faced by real people. So it might be designing accessible playgrounds for the community. Um, there are authentic tasks and tools. So uh, using the same uh, tools that uh, a professional would use to solve a specific problem. Um, so maybe that's using computer-aided design to uh, design that uh, playground that I was just talking about. Maybe it's using video editing software to create a PSA uh, that has to do with something relevant to the community. Um, there's also authentic impact, which is uh, whether something directly impacts or is used in the real world. So it might be creating an app that helps find black owned businesses or um, improving an app that does that to specifically work within, um, within the community that you exist. Um, and there's personal authenticity as well. And I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us try to uh, find personal authenticity in our classes too when we ask students to do projects. So asking them to solve uh, a personal problem, an issue, a concern, uh, draw on their interests and attach what we're learning, what we're practicing in the class to that. Um, so um, for Example, uh, if I were to, I don't know, for a marketing class, work with the American uh, Stroke Association and create uh, an informational ad and where those would uh, be released, that sort of thing. Um, if that's something that I'm interested in, then maybe that would be what my project focuses on, what um, picking up things that I've learned from class, but applying it to something that is specific to my interests. Um, but it doesn't mean that it isn't interesting or important to other people, 
Um, but I'm more likely to be engaged and feel like it's important or valuable when it's something that I care about specifically. So um, I think the curiosity and authenticity really, really overlap in interesting ways. Thinking about getting students curious about our topics and thinking about how then they can apply that uh, to the world. How can they use the content? How they can meet, how they can use the skills. So um, whether it's in the chat or um, if you want to turn on your mic, you're also welcome to do that. I'm curious if uh, any of you are uh, using curiosity or authenticity in your courses, how you're using them or how you've seen other people using them. And if there's specific challenges that you've experienced or that you would ought, um, anticipate experiencing in using curiosity or authenticity within your courses. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, so I've tried in my sociology courses that are methods courses to pick topics that would be of, of interest to students, um, whether it be like a global type issue, like, like studying issues of global warming or a more like localized issue, like studying the experiences of being a college student. Um, in terms of authenticity, I guess I've tried to do like authentic, using authentic tasks and tools. In other words, developing a project and having the students use the software and other techniques that ethnographers would use. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say the challenge has always been that um, I think that even though I'm going back to what I said originally, that how I think about learning isn't apparently how students always think about learning. I think the challenge is that sometimes the students, uh, yeah, they just don't see it that way. Like, so like when we're using the authentic task and tools, instead of seeing, oh, this is how real sociologists actually do research, I think they're more likely to think, oh my God, this is just a lot of uh, tedious work, <laughs> which it is. It is tedious to, to analyze qualitative data. So instead of thinking, oh, this is authentic, they instead just, uh, often described as busy work, which to them is like the opposite of authentic. So, so yeah, trying to find that balance is, is a challenge for me, at least. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's 100% um, something that I think is, is relatable, this idea that um, sometimes also you'll say like, oh, this is how you can use this uh, in the real world and there's just a lack of interest in using it in the real world, right? They don't have that connection um, or uh, or interest or it's like, well, this is, this is too much. This is not what I would, you know, this is not the field that I wanna go into. This is not, um, this is not what I'm interested in. I've had students tell me, I, well, I'm not gonna be a writer, so I don't need to learn how to do this particular thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that challenge is very relatable, um, but it sounds like you're doing great things in your class, uh, and making those connections in really, uh, in really interesting ways and grounding, um, grounding the work that you're doing, um, giving important context, which is awesome. Um, let me see. Yeah, go ahead, JC. Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to share quickly that I'm very fortunate because the classes I teach, we do real world consulting in in the classes. So like we I we I get to work with a new company every class. <laughs> so that allows for my curiosity, right? I get to learn and ask questions along with the students, which is fun. And it's just feels like a great opportunity for students to like work with a real company. The biggest challenge that I see for 
my students uh, is that students are so focused on grades that yeah. I feel like they often don't even know what to do when something is kind of open. Um, you need to, you don't have all the information. We need to ask questions of our client. And they just sometimes are, I think, afraid to challenge themselves because I have students say, like, just tell me what I need to do to get an A. Like, instead of yeah. really thinking about this experience and what you're learning and you can fail here, like, that's okay. It's, it's just really hard to get them there. I, uh, 100%, I think that's amazing that you get to work with companies. Like, that's so exciting. Like, that would really spark joy in me too. Um, but I, I, you bring up such a great point too, that it's getting them, it's getting them on board. And we're going to talk about grading, um, in a few minutes too, and this idea of failure. But I think that, um, you're striking into this larger thing where the education system, um, isn't setting students up to, uh, find joy and learning mm -hmm. these skills, it's it's setting them up for anxiety over being able to do them to your expectations in order to get a specific grade. Um, and even if you're actively trying to uh, work against that in your class, it's been so ingrained. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's a really common um, issue that is hard to overcome and. Like I said, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but, um, but yeah, oh my gosh, I want to take all your classes. This is, this <laughs> sounds really exciting. I'm excited that, uh, you all are, are doing such cool things. And Bill is also saying that, um, the lab is hands-on with modern tools and technologies and Bill's bringing in items and advances in science to anchor daily discussions, which is great too. Um, okay. I want to talk about two additional, um, concepts. Um, so Eiler brings in, uh, sociality as being a large aspect of student success and their ability to learn. So if they're building relationships, um, with their peers and if they're building relationships with their instructor um that makes them feel supported and comfortable asking questions not getting everything right uh the first time it makes them feel like they have a support network um and Eiler has brought up that this is really difficult for those of us that teach online classes especially if they're asynchronous. There's just not that much connection. Even synchronous classes have a lot of problems um, having those connections too, right? Like that's something that's really difficult. Do you make people turn on their uh, cameras? Is that something that uh, is going to put them in a bad attitude for the class? Do they not want to share things? You know, is it not safe for them? Um, these, these are larger conversations surrounding that. But he also talks about how uh, whether you're face-to-face -face or not, you can create videos of you talking about things to uh, help build a connection further. Um, we know that humans are forming uh, parasocial relationships with uh, people that they see online all the time because they watch their videos and they feel like they have insight to their lives. So uh, if you can build in aspects of that, even if you are face-to-face, -face, you could record videos of you talking about assignments or um, going over uh, questions that people have been having. Um, you can obviously do group work or have uh, conferences, even for those of us that have really, really large classes. You might have group conferences where you have people with the, you know, last name, you know, A through F, and this is your time to come and talk to me. Um, and so you can maybe give a little bit more individual attention, um, a variety of spaces where they can meet with you either online or in person, not necessarily just your office. Um, 
and encouraging students to also use video messages. Sometimes that's uh, something that they enjoy, um, especially in asynchronous classes. If you can encourage them to create video messages that are very informal um, and just share them with, uh, with their classmates, with you, that also helps create this connection of like, oh yeah, there are actually other people um, involved here. It's not just a name associated with an ID number. Um, you know, there's uh, living, breathing people that are also taking this class that um, also are seeking out connections and want to be successful. And I, uh, again, I see that overlapping a lot with emotion. So Eiler talks about how um, looking at uh, uh, early education um, consultants and what they're saying about uh, about children and from the very beginning of their learning stages, um, and especially within uh, classroom settings, students learn better if they feel positive and if the situation surrounding them is positive. Um, I don't think that's a big surprise. I know that some of us have classes that might have to deal with uh, hard topics, um, but that doesn't mean that the class overall can't be um, positive, can't be fun, can't uh, have connection among um, among the people in there, even if you're learning about a uh, topic, um, you know, maybe from history or maybe from the current state of the world that uh, is a bummer, is sad, is uh, anxiety inducing, is scary. Um, so, you might set the tone for the class by having um, like fun, exciting videos or music, uh, fun icebreakers or topics to start the class off with. Uh, it, when I've covered topics that are upsetting in my gender and sexuality courses, um, not surprising, you know, talking about violence, upsetting. Um, we try to do uh, at the end of the class sort of like, we do a debrief, but then we also try to like reset our energy so that they're not taking that into uh, the classes and the spaces afterwards. So what can we do in order to uh, at least get back to neutral, if not positive? Um, can we listen to a, a funny song? Can we talk about uh, Taylor Swift? What can we do to sort of reset? Um, and students really enjoy sharing their own videos, their own music, uh, coming up with the topics that we're going to talk about as well. Um, so that's an opportunity for them to share more about themselves as well, get that uh, sociality aspect going. Um, and they get to connect a little bit more with you too, if you're able to be like, oh my gosh, this is my favorite song. Let's listen to this thing or this is the the funniest video that I've seen on TikTok lately. Let's look at this. Um, it could be five minutes. Uh, it could even be something that's happening as they're uh, shuffling into the room before class starts. So how are we going to set the tone? How are we going to um, make sure that they're coming into a space that is comfortable? Um, that's not to say that you have to be like, happy, perky, uh, you know, happy, go lucky, smiling all the time. Obviously that is not realistic. You don't have to fake things for students. Um, it doesn't do them any benefit. It doesn't do you any benefit. Uh, but having some sort of like a positive attitude about like, we're coming into this space together to learn, um, that goes a long way. And again, if you, I don't know if they do uh if they take an exam and things aren't going well um we can still have an energy reset before we go and talk about something else so uh how are you breaking up that feeling um even giving them five minutes after something feels off 
uh, or negative or icky for them to uh, leave the room, walk around the building, go outside, touch some grass, and then come back in to ready to uh, take on some some different uh, topics and take on a new um, a new mindset for the rest of the class. And that goes for you too, right? Um, sometimes you also need that. Um, but Eiler says, and we have people backing this up everywhere, uh, that students whose emotions are overwhelming, they don't have the bandwidth to learn and retain new information. And you're seeing this all the time when we're talking about students that are being bullied um, or um, environments, even, you know, during um, extreme sort of lockdown parts of uh, the pandemic where students, you know, were scared, they were in homes that they didn't feel safe in, they weren't learning and retaining new information. Um, so if you're covering distressing topics, again, um, if you can use uh, something to sort of um, buffer that, but also if you can use content warnings um, to help students prepare um, that something's coming and they can also sort of regulate their emotions. Um, this isn't going to work 100% of the time, but it certainly puts uh, students into a position where they can make decisions for their own learning and for uh, their own emotional safety. Um, and generally uh, allows students to opt into the conversations that are going to be happening. Um, but then again, um, like after that happens, uh, talk about Beyonce, <laughs> talk, about, talk about something um, fun and not necessarily uh, specific to class to sort of break that up. Or if you can relate to class, that's also awesome. Yeah, GC. Sorry, I think maybe I just left my hand up <laughs> from before. Oh, okay, no worries, no worries. But I'm laughing about Beyonce, so it's all right. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I I think that talking about uh, pop culture and talking about music and talking about performance and stuff, like obviously um, relates a lot of times to, maybe not obviously to my gender and sexuality courses, but also, uh, students just love to like have that reset and have that connection with others and with me and uh they also like to see my reactions when they say things too so um that is fun for all of us um and i think time well spent at the top of class or at the end of class uh it's enjoyable for all of us and to get uh, all of us to be able to connect with with each other is um really important um, I also say that this book came out in 2018. Um, so Eiler has some other like thoughts and insights and, and whatnot since um, since education went online um, to the degree that it did. Um, but a lot of this does focus on like connection between humans. And I think that some of us might have, uh, not expected that to be so important until after um, moving to online classes, whether they're synchronous or on asynchronous. Um, anyway, um, thinking about sociality and emotion, um, I'm curious how you are building um, those relationships and setting up opportunities for positive emotions in your class. Uh, oh gosh, I have a, a, a typo there, uh, but I meant to say, have you experienced that in other people's classes that you've taken or observed? Like what are some cool things that you've seen or that you've done? And are there particular challenges that you've uh, experienced when you've been trying to um, encourage social, uh, 
social relationships or just chatting um, in, in your classes or trying to uh, set people up with uh, positive emotions? Um, have there been challenges where people just aren't buying in um, to this or are they things that you've been doing really well or you've seen other people do well? Well, I can kind of contrast some teaching yeah. experiences I've had in that um, when I was on sabbatical a few years back, I was doing a, or I thought I was going to do a project about um, sort of the sociology of risk and lifestyle sports, which is just background to get to. During my sabbatical, I worked as a snowboard instructor <laughs> um, in order to <laughs> gather ethnographic data. And okay. It was very interesting working as a snowboard instructor to see, uh, I mean, because a lot of what we're talking about here today is sort of built in because one, people are taking snowboard lessons because they want to learn to snowboard. Um, there might be frustrations and things as they're trying to learn. They might end up hurting themselves, but um, there's already curiosity, authenticity. It's pretty easy to sort of have sociality, you know, within like a, a small class like that and then the emotions in general tend to be positive i mean there are some people that you know don't really want to be there or just get really frustrated but in general you know my interactions with students as a snowboard instructor were just fundamentally different <laughs> than my interactions with students in my regular classroom right that like one really big one is that students didn't feel the need to try to like pretend or hide when they were having trouble. Instead, they wanted to talk about, well, what technique can I use to initiate a toe side turn or, or something? Whereas in class, yeah. it seems like students want to pretend that they understand things when they really don't because they're scared to talk about it. Um, but anyways, yeah, the sort of positive emotions, right? Like nobody gives me a high five after what I think is a really good lecture, but people give you high fives <laughs> all the time when you're teaching them to snowboard. So, um, I, I've very unsuccessfully <laughs> tried to incorporate some of those sort of principles in the classroom, but yeah, it's, it's all fallen on its face, but it was, it was at least interesting to be like, oh, wow, you know, people can learn and actually be excited about it as opposed to treating learning like, you know, a, a chore that you've got to get through. Yeah, 100%. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's so interesting. I've seen um, a lot of videos. Uh, my nephew is doing uh, speech therapy, and I've seen a lot of videos of uh, kids doing speech therapy. And the speech therapists uh, like are able to do it in a way that that kids don't feel like it's um, learning. You know, they don't feel like they're in school. Um, and I'm like, how can I? I I'm chasing that, right? I'm. I'm chasing those feelings, and uh, I think it's different with the with older learners. Um, like they're uh, more afraid of making mistakes and um, feeling silly, um, like you brought up. But uh, but yeah, if only we could have that energy going into all of these spaces where we're where we're learners. Um, let me see. Bill's saying large classrooms where students tend to spread out, challenges uh, by pair and share efforts. Um, also, as an introvert, I try to respect those that approach social interactions carefully, balancing best practices with do no harm approach um, to working with other humans. I also work really hard to respect the students as emerging adults. So autonomy of participation versus forced participation, 100%. Um, that is, it's such a difficult thing to uh, try to force uh, social interactions when people, not everybody's buying in um, or for whatever reason. Um, whether it's maybe because they don't have a positive attitude uh, or they don't like the person that they're um, interacting with, or if they're just uncomfortable for whatever reason might be personal. Um, 
And so that can be really difficult. It can also be difficult, um, you know, when we were all masking and asked to separate in class, and sometimes we'll still have students that are masking and separating for uh, personal safety or safety of others, then to try to get them to work with other people in the class, that feels like a big ask, right? Um, so we have to be mindful of uh, and, and respectful of what they feel like they can do and um, while, while also creating these opportunities for them to connect with other people, yeah. I think um, what you all have been saying, um, I alluded to this earlier, really connects well with this uh, last concept that Eiler brings up, which is failure. This is a concept that we've been talking about a lot in higher education and K through 12 education as well. Um, this idea that we need to have growth mindset, that we need to uh, encourage growth mindset in our students, the idea that uh, making mistakes is part of their learning process. Um, Eiler says that mistakes help the brain spark and grow. And we especially see this with, uh, with young uh, children um, and also which is just like uh, preteens and teens, right? They make a mistake and um, they will hopefully learn how to do something um, better. Uh, you know, we see kids trying to learn to walk and they make mistakes, but they learn from that. We see uh, kids learning how to, and, and adults too, uh, learning how to, uh, my mind goes to play basketball, but snowboarding is also a great example of this, right? We're learning how to do something um, physical, but also have our mentality in the right spots too, so that our, our brain is firing at the right time to tell our body to do this thing, to anticipate what's coming. And um, those things are often not graded, right? Um, my brother teaches uh, people to run marathons which is um, an interesting hobby of his, um, but he's not grading people's performance. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's not telling them, oh, um, you had to stop and walk today. That's a C. Um, when they have to stop and walk, they're talking about, oh, hey, are you feeling, are you feeling lightheaded? It could be because, be because of this. Are you dehydrated? Let's look at this thing. You have a cramp here. Let's stretch that. So it's talking about, um, they talk about skills, um, not about evaluating um, the process or the progress. Um, and so we talk a lot about mistakes being part of the learning cycle. Um, but education really um, stigmatizes and penalizes mistakes. And the fact that we um, assign grades to things, um, the education system is set up that uh, students have to have GPAs. So we have to assign grades um, and the letters become numbers, become access to money or ability to apply for specific programs. Um, and so there's a lot of weight attached to those things. Um, but Eiler is saying that students learn more from feedback, not evaluation, and um, really encourages people to uh, talk about skills being more important than GPA. So if you can um, grade in a way that focuses on overall uh, application of skills or under understanding of content rather than um, whether or not they're getting along, um, you know, 
along the way. Uh, that's helpful. I'll be talking a bit about, uh, as a plug, <laughs> about grading beyond um, exams and essays in a few weeks. So uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about this. Uh, but either really talks about content grading and thinking about um, what are we evaluating and what are we focusing on with the way that we are giving students grades. And if we aren't giving them grades immediately, if we're saying, oh, hold off, like work on this, as JC mentioned, um, encouraging students to think about things and have curiosity and do what makes sense for a project rather than um, answer specific questions, sometimes that gives them anxiety because they're told to do X, Y, Z things to get a, an A so consistently throughout their educational um, progress. So that's something that we really have to uh, be intentional about overcoming and reassure them frequently that they're going to be okay. Um, this is this is what we're working towards. Uh, you know, this is where uh, I see um, you doing well. Uh, okay, you're having, you're struggling with this thing, let's sit down and talk about it. And again, this becomes harder for bigger classes. Uh, but if you can build in a buffer for failure and make students feel like that's okay, um, maybe part of it is not marketing as failure. Maybe part of it is marketing as mistakes, uh, which feels maybe a little bit lighter. Um, but allowing them to have that buffer to uh, feel comfortable not getting everything perfect the first time, um, that really helps with students being able to learn because if they learn for the test and they take the test and they did perfect and they move on, that information is just going to be um, just generally not retrievable um, for them. It's not going to stick with them in the long term, um, like making a mistake might. Um, so the iterative, iterative, excuse me, learning cycle is uh, something that again we we probably have talked about. We you probably looked at before, but this idea of uh, trying, failing, evaluating. Uh, what went wrong, and then refining your practice to try again. And I think that sometimes sharing that cycle with students and sort of normalizing it um, can help reassure them that this is okay, this is part of this uh, process, and that it's normal to not get everything right the first time. Um, and that they might not have everything exactly correct by the end of the class too, and that's okay. So, um, again, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious about failure in your classes. How are you making it a part of your classes? Do you plan on doing that? Um, and, and what are some challenges that you've experienced? Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I uh, want to give you all a chance to, to share if you have some um, new things to uh, to bring up as far as especially challenges or things that you're doing well um, when it comes to failure, works in progress even. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't, I've never thought about it in terms of the term failure per se, but um, for several years now for the first research paper, uh, the students write in my different classes, I give them an opportunity to revise and resubmit the paper, you know, so I basically evaluate yeah. it and then students have the choice. They don't have to revise and resubmit, but they have the choice to take my suggestions and then resubmit it for uh, a better, a better grade. The, the challenge there is that um, oftentimes the students interested in doing it are the students that had very little to change in the first place because they already got yeah. a very good grade and yeah, there's just not really actually that much room for, well, there's always room for improvement, but there's not too much room in terms of the parameters of the assignment. 
And then yeah. the students that are, uh, then the other students that, that want to take the assignment, either because of time constraints or just other sort of outside factors are not capable or willing to actually do the things that be required to actually make revisions. So they might resubmit the paper, but they've literally just changed three or four words on a, on a paper mm -hmm. that didn't meet any of the requirements. And so, um, yeah, there, there've been a few over the years, a few su sort of successful, like, oh, this paper's better now that we've done this. Um, but, <laughs> but if, in general, it's, it's not worked to the degree that I have hoped it has, but I've tried to at least build in this idea that, yeah, you know, the first time you do this paper, it's maybe not going to be perfect, but here's an opportunity to try to try to improve. But but again, it's not clear to me if students are thinking about it in the in the in the sort of growth mindset that I'm trying to present it to them as. 100 percent. I think that's such a first of all, that's a great thing to do, and it takes energy on your part to do it. So. Um, that's not something that is just like, oh, I'm going to do this now um, and doesn't take extra time and energy. So um, first of all, kudos for doing that, because that's um, especially if you're not seeing necessarily the return. Um, I I think that's still great that you're doing it. Um, Eiler also talks about how final grades um, students. Um, get more out of actually getting feedback on a final project, even if they don't get a chance to revise and resubmit, um, than just a grade. That, that's really, really helpful for them. And again, individuals, they might choose to not read it. They might choose to be like, okay, I'm done with this class. Never mind. Um, but the, the research shows that that's a really important part um, so even if they don't get a chance to revise, even if they don't get a chance to dig into all the things that they uh, could be digging into, I think letting them know the things that um, they're doing well and the things that could be improved is still uh, a huge benefit to students, um, especially those are that are really anxious about not being perfect um, and have that uh, anxiety and stress. Um, let me see. We are at 11. Um, I see Bill has a large comment, uh, which is great talking about participation, um, auto uh, autonomy with participation and forced participation, um, and also talking about, uh, I believe low stakes quizzes um, and the idea of like we're we're going to go back and we can we can work on these uh, um, these concepts again and, and build, uh, which is great. Um, so if you want to stick around and share more with me, I'm so happy to uh, continue to talk with you all. But again, it's 11. It's 1101 now. Um, and I want to be so respectful of your time. I appreciate you all showing up and um, coming out and sharing and uh, listening to me today. Um, so I'll be sending out uh, all this information about the book and about the uh, PowerPoint um, in a few um, in a few hours. But I appreciate you all joining me and having these. Uh, these conversations. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, I, I appreciate you and you're doing such wonderful things in your class. So I hope that you are feeling that at least today. Bye everyone.